Hi everyone, welcome back to the May edition of the Smart Pack Ask the Vet video series. Spring is finally here. Finally, 70 degrees. It's Woo. pretty nice. It's pretty good. We're enjoying it. And we're back to answer your top five most popular questions as submitted and voted on by fans right. like you. So thank you guys for the questions. Thank you for voting. And we will jump right in. But first, we have a question that we've gotten a couple of times. Okay. Uh, we tend to wear Smart Pack tops. Right. And we've gotten some questions about what we're wearing in the video. Oh. So today, we wanted to let you guys know we're wearing the brand new Ecology Color Block Short Sleeve Shirt by Smart Pack. Mm -hmm. And the Ecology line is actually all made from earth-friendly materials, and so that's why the tagline is look good, do good, feel great. I and didn't know that. <laughs> but we do feel great. We do. We feel we pretty do. great. So we'll get started. We'll jump right in with the first question. Okay. And this is submitted by a user name, which I really enjoy. Okay, maybe not. Ooh. <laughs> via YouTube. And they're wondering, how do I know how much weight a horse can carry? How much the rider can weigh before it gets, quote, bad for the horse? I know it depends on age, experience, muscles on the horse, but can you count it out? Which is interesting, because we've gotten a lot of questions about horse weight. That's the first yes, question we've had about right. rider weight. And I was kind of waiting for this question, so I did do a little bit of reading. So there's an industry standard of 20%, and I know you like math. So if we have a thousand pound horse, 20% uh -huh. is 200 pounds. Right. Yes. So that's sort of the industry standard. Like I know there are some associations that use that number. There is some science behind it. Um, one study I found looked at horses carrying 15, 20, 25, and 30 percent of their weight. And they looked at heart rate and respiratory rate, muscle soreness the next day. Muscle was one of her um, specific questions. And they found that it was at 25% that horses began to show signs of, this is hard, I'm fatigued, it's made me uncomfortable the next day. So keeping that 20% or under is ideal. That said, it's gonna vary with, are you working in a level groomed arena? Are you, for like an hour? Are you going up hills on trails all day? Uh, and are you a beginner rider that's bulky maybe? or an advanced rider, because that matters if the horse, if you're with the horse, or you're sort mm. of a sack of potatoes, you mm. know? So there are some factors that go in with that 20% number, but like I said, that's kind of the industry standard. You know, when you talk about rider fitness, the thing I kind of think of is like when you're trying to tai pick chi. up a... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's what you think of, but like when you're trying to pick up a, like a child, and if it's a very unwilling child, and they're just like limp, and Great they're example. so much heavier than a kid who's, you know, kind of trying to help you. Great example, yeah. Um, so I think that's a kind of a similar thing with the rider fitness. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think about weight with horses because they think about like farm horses that do plow work and you when you drive with pulling. human they're pulling and yeah. that's and can you explain why that's different and how it impacts the the weight that they can handle differently um i don't know if i can explain that but i can tell you that for pulling because i've looked into this it's something that i need to know as a carriage driver again if it's a level flat sh just uh, surface in a short distance time frame then they can pull up to three times their weight. That's pretty cool. But if it's you know deep sand or it's hilly going or it's a long time, it might be better to have a one to one ratio. Mm -hmm. That's still, they can pull a lot more than they can carry. carry. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you think about it again, I don't know if you can come up with another example, but you know, pull, carrying something versus pulling something, it, it's a lot different mechanics in the body. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. All right, our next question is from Caitlin, also submitted via YouTube. And Caitlin, unfortunately, had a horse who was diagnosed with Lyme disease oh. this past winter. She lives in Connecticut. As a oh, New Yorker, I can sympathize. It is not the state. I've been there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> her most prominent, her horse's most prominent symptom was behavioral change. And she said she went from a laid back, easy horse to being very difficult to handle. And she's wondering what are some of the other signs and right. symptoms of Lyme disease in horses? What are the treatment options? Can it cause any long-term complications? Okay, um, as far as signs, this is a tough, tough one to diagnose because the signs can be all over the place. And you know, behavior is one of them, but it's probably not the one that, that veterinarians or owners think of as like first. Um, this is notorious for a shifting lameness in that mm. One day the right front hurts, and then a couple days later the left front hurts, and then it goes around. Um, low grade fever, uh, muscle soreness, we're hitting that again, 
and also something called hyperesthesia, which means if I touch you, it hurts more than it should. Mm -hmm. you're, you're extra sensitive to, to just um, touching. They can have uh, neurological problems, ataxia, so like weakness and wobbling, um, head tilt, um, what else? Oh, a uveitis, so eye infection. Mm. So see, it's, it's a, almost everything. Right. Um, but, but really we think of, of swollen joints and arthritis and lameness, that, that kind of thing, shifting lameness, yeah. As far as treatment options oh, and long-term complications, what would you say? Treatment, oh boy, this is tough too because it's, it looks like the tetracycline family is the most effective. It's a, it's a bacteria, it's a spirochete. Um, so oxytetracycline intravenous, which may mean either you have yeah. to bring the horse to the vet or the vet has to come to you. And it's a long time, it's like a month. So mm. it's expensive also. Is it like one shot or are you mm. hanging an no. IV bag and it's, fluids and all that? Yeah, it's like yeah. every day. And then, so there's doxycycline, which is sort of the next generation, and that's oral. It's not very bioavailable and you still have to give it for weeks and weeks and weeks. They're looking at a new, I guess it'd be third generation of tetracycline called uh, minocycline. And that might work better. It's, it's more expensive right now, but, so, but this is an active area of, of research. And she had oh, complications. Um, the thing with Lyme disease is, as we know in people, you might not be able to completely clear the infection. And you're mm -hmm. left with some not, not residual deficits as much as just lingering problems. Like mm -hmm. maybe, I don't, not for sure in this case, but it, here's an example. Maybe the behavior doesn't completely go back to what it was. Um, the other problem is w when you're in an area that has a high incidence of Lyme disease or you've, your horse or you have had it, you're kind of always thinking because the range of signs is so big that maybe anything my horse does is Lyme disease and mm. it doesn't have to be. Maybe your horse is really lame. So this is probably not what she means, but it's a complication. Just not thinking of other things that your horse could really have. Right, it's changing the way you evaluate your horse. Yeah, yeah. so don't, don't neglect a true diagnosis for anything that's wrong with your horse. I mean, don't assume that a fever is Lyme disease. It could be something else. So always have everything checked out by a vet. You used a word in uh, your answer about the treatment that I think not a lot of people understand, but we okay. come across a lot at Smart Pack. I mean, you used a lot of tetracycline <laughs> and all of those things. But the one that I'm thinking of is bioavailable. Oh. Can you explain what that means for horses? Um, so biologically available, meaning that, and we speak of it in terms of, of an oral. So mm -hmm. when you swallow something, how much of a pill or a powder or whatever that you are taking in eventually gets into the bloodstream and around the body. And, and so some things are really bioavailable and some things are not. And some things you have to combine with. The perfect example in people, if you take a, a, like an iron supplement, you have to take something with it like vitamin C that, that has vitamin C like orange juice mm. that helps it get absorbed better. So some things you don't have an absolute bioavailability, but you can affect it with other things simultaneously. Okay. So tip out there for all of you taking iron supplements, get more for your money. Our third question is actually our first repeat question selection. Oh. We have Kelly who had submitted a question that we answered in an earlier oh, video. Okay. And she's so great at asking questions. I think we might have a future DVM on our hands. <laughs> uh, so she has another question for us and she's wondering if we can explain the difference, um, if you can explain the difference realistically. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not gonna explain. Uh, the difference between hay stretcher and extender oh. and forage replacer. Is it companies using different names or is there an actual difference? Ooh. So the words are stretcher, extender, replacer. Yes, ma'am. And I looked up every feed company that I could think of. They use them, this is a very scientific word now, willy-nilly. <laughs> um, AFCO, which is the, the, sort of the, the regulatory body, the guidance body that nutritionists use to, to make sure that we talk the same and we're all using the same words and ingredients are approved and all that. There's not a definition that they're using, which means that those terms, stretcher, extender, replacer, are more marketing terms. Mm. So my advice in this area is, whatever company you're using, read the label. Because I, I read them all, and some say you can use our product and replace up to 50% of the okay. hay. Some said 75%. 
and some said 100%. Some of them are just forage, because it's hay replacer, stretcher extender, so there has to be like a long stem chewing part of it. Mm -hmm. um, others have some vitamins, minerals, or other things added, and some are, you don't need anything else, no grain at all, just give this product. Mm. So you really have to read the label. Uh, so that that's my advice is, is is reading some of the like similar with the grains that we've talked about where the complete feed really is a replacement for the forage and everything whereas a grain is just in an addition and so it's understanding really what's in it yeah and so some companies that don't offer a, a, a hay stretcher that's made of hay mm -hmm. use their complete feed line mm. as their hay stretcher mm -hmm. and so that tells you right there there's no accepted definition because if a hay stretcher for one company is hay and a hay stretcher for a different company is a complete feed probably based in bee pulp that tells you right there uh oh there <laughs> so we got to read the labels okay our next question is from Haley uh, and it was submitted via YouTube and Haley is considering getting a fly sheet for her horse but she lives in Alabama and it stays pretty hot and humid all year round with the exception of three or four months. And she's wondering if there's any point where it may be too hot or humid for a fly sheet while out in the pasture. Would she be better off without one and kind of letting her horse, you know, cope with the flies rather than get too hot? So clearly already spring in Alabama. Yeah, really. Um, you know, I, I'm not one that puts a fly sheet on my horse because he really doesn't care about flies. But for those that do, to me, this is a very individual horse thing. Interestingly, some horses are going to be cooler with a fly sheet on. I know. Um, so some fly sheets are made with the complete top is solid, mm. and then the sides are mesh. Mm -hmm. And of course, they have the neck parts, and, and you can buy, you know, uh, leggings, fly leggings. Bottom, you know. Fly boots. Fly boots, yes. Leggings. <laughs> leggings. And, and the so, 80s all yeah. over again. <laughs> so you have to know your horse. I, I do know people that if you don't buy the right size in a fly sheet, that the, the insects can get up in there. Ooh. The, yeah, that's that a problem. a worse that's situation. A but if you're, if you're concerned about your horse's comfort, um, how hot he is, how he's able to cope with the weather, um, the UV radiation and, and other things, weight maybe, body condition score, some do better with a fly sheet because they're just more comfortable, they're relaxed, they're relieved, they're not anxious, they're not running around, they're not stomping, life is good. And they'll wait on you and say, mm, don't leave yet, then you forget something. <laughs> and so you're not gonna get the, out of the barn in the morning until you put that fly sheet on. And it, it's, some horses are not gonna tolerate it. Like mine will go out with a fly mask. Mm. He's like, you know, and I'm like, oh, sorry. So it's really an individual horse thing and the close observation, again, like a blanket, you don't put a fly sheet on and leave it for the summer. You put it on, you take it off, and you're like, how's it going under there? Because you don't want to miss a skin thing. Similar with winter blankets. It's, it's exactly the same as winter blankets. You just don't put it and leave it. You put it on and check it. Yeah. Is Newman a with or without ears guy? Oh, with. Oh, yeah, yeah. With. okay. Yeah. We have it. the little gnats. Ooh, yeah. 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 And do you clip his ears? No, because I showed dressage, and they, it's not something we do. Yeah. All right. I like it. Our last question for this month was submitted by Michelle via YouTube. And okay. Michelle is wondering if we have any tips on a horse that is very sensitive to bug bites in the summer and ends up with hives and rubbing out her mane and tail. So I think we're, we're seeing a theme in the questions. We're moving towards the warm weather. People get nervous. Well, we could, the easy answer would be flesh eat, <laughs> right? But um, there, there's more to it, because when I think about a horse that it not only doesn't like bugs, but it but really has problems because of reactions. Them. Yeah, I divide it in two areas, and, and you can help me fill these out. But one is what can we do to make the bugs less, make the horse less attracted to the bugs, mm. and what can we do in the environment to make it less hospitable mm. to any insects that might want to raise a family there. Okay. So going to the horse, there are certainly things you can feed them, um, supplements that have like garlic and uh, apple cider vinegar. Um, brewer's yeast that have all been shown to be, make the outside of the horse just less appealing to insects. So either they're just not attracted or they're, they're unattracted. Um, so here's a question I used okay. to get when folks would call into our customer care yeah. team. If I feed my horse garlic and apple cider vinegar, is he going to smell like an Italian restaurant? <laughs> you know, the theme of this, of today's uh, video seems to be, it depends. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's individual horse. 
honestly, I, I feel like I can some horses, but others I can't. So, and 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 similar, there are some horses who like garlic and mm -hmm. vinegar and these things, and some that don't. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got to try it and, and some see. Some people who like it too. Like people yeah. would always say, like it's a bad thing. I'm like, that sounds pretty good. Well, it's, I was thinking, you know, garlic makes horses less attractive to insects, and garlic makes people less attractive to vampires. People or vampires. <laughs> That's <laughs> where I assumed you were going. No, no, it's people. Okay. Yeah, vampires is good. All right, so we have kind of the supplements you can feed right. to make your horse less attractive. What about the environment situation you were talking about? Well, certainly manure removal is, is huge. And then making sure that there's not standing water where mosquitoes and things like to breathe. There's with mosquito donks you could put in water tanks and sort of keep keep their ability for their larvae to, to be in there. Even if the horse is drinking out of it? Y yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, uh, what else about the environment? We, so in our barn, we use these things called cool curtains. They hang, they're a mesh, and the bugs can't get in. So when you're in the aisle grooming, it's really nice because it's the sun doesn't get in, the bugs don't get in. It's sort of a nice environment. And, and then you go outside and whew, um, fly sheets, we've already mentioned, mm -hmm. fly masks. Um, other things in the environment are you can have a, a spray unit, an automatic sprayer in the barn that, mm -hmm. that puts out a, a mist occasionally. Uh, you set it for how often you want it to go off. Like it wouldn't go off very much in, in non-buggy seasons, but it would go off more when it gets really crazy. It's helpful to know which insects your horse is most reactive to because they all have different feeding times. So you may want to turn out your horse at night mm -hmm. if it's a daytime insect that is particularly pesky or vice versa. Fans, I can't say enough good things about fans. Mm -hmm. I mean, because especially the gnats we mentioned earlier can't fly in wind. You know, their little wings, <laughs> Very they're small. just not heavy enough. Right, yep. they're too small. So fans are, are fantastic, they're your best friend. But, but turn out appropriately, timing it, that helps so much. Okay. Well, those are the questions that we have for this month. So thank you guys all for submitting such great questions. We're looking forward to next month already. Oh, man. You can uh, submit your questions on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter using hashtag AskTheVetVideo. We'll uh, select a couple of questions to get voted on, and the top five voted by fans like you will be selected for our June edition. And if your uh, question is selected, you'll be the winner of a Smart Pack gift card, which is pretty sweet. Awesome. And, and you can win more than once. Right. Oh, you we can't. Yeah, oh, we can't. she's going to get Kelly's yeah. getting her second one. Yeah. And we still haven't gotten any. But we do have these pretty sweet shirts. That's so what I was thinking. It's yeah. pretty good. Um, so if you have won, if your question was selected and you haven't uh, reached out to us yet, you can claim your gift card by checking your direct messages on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And if you can't find your DMs or you're just having trouble, you can always email customer care at SmartPack or give us a call and let us know that your question was answered. Yeah, call Sarah. You did yeah. just on my cell phone, yeah. Yeah. as the song goes. And so that's all we have for now. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thanks for the great questions and have a great ride.